Okay. Um, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. Thanks a lot for, for the invitation. My, my talk continues immediately after uh, the one that uh, Agalos did. And uh, for me now, the question that follows from it is, what are the type of issues, teams of informatics uh, experts, computer scientists, and lawyers should uh, address? What uh, are the issues that they can jointly tackle? Um, and to me, to summarize the, the last slides of, of Agalos's talk, it breaks down to two questions. The first one is, what other things are a little bit like money? What other exchanges do we have in our society that can be adequately represented by the exchange of money for something else? So can we abstract away from uh, barter economy, buying goods, to other issues that show the same structural features? And secondly, um, where else in our society do we see problems uh, that in current arrangements exist but uh, could potentially be overcome by a combination of blockchain technology and cryptography? Both of them, I think, have to be answered together. It's not good enough to find interesting technological solutions for a problem no one has. So the first starting point, and that is where I think lawyers, social scientists, and uh, informatics experts need to work closer together mm -hmm. is to actually understand what are the types of problems that we face as a society that could potentially be solved through a distributed ledger approach. And secondly, uh, the question, if there are the sort of problems, can we reconfigure them as monetary exchange problems? Um, we heard a little bit about copyright as one possible application. We know there is a problem with copyright theft. We know that the creative industries are suffering because it has become so easy uh, to copy digital objects. And we also know that the existing hierarchical institutional solutions do not really work. Artists have to rely on collecting societies. They have to rely on big uh, monopoly publishing houses. None of them work particularly well for artists. They work for all lots of other people. They work for big music houses, they work for some bureaucrats in uh, the collecting societies. That's really nice, but it doesn't work really well for those people who create the value. So whenever we find that sort of problem, we can ask ourselves, is there a potential way in which informatics can help? Now, um, the potential application I want to talk about seems initially to uh, say no to both of these questions something that is really far away from ordinary exchange of money for goods. And we also we might feel there is not really that sort of problem in our society. And I try to convince you that potentially at least those answers should be reconsidered. Uh, and I want to talk about votes. Is voting in a democratic process a little bit like uh, giving money for goods? And do we actually have a problem? with our democratic process, with the voting process, that is sufficiently similar um, to the type of problem that a distributed ledger technology tries to solve. On the first point, well, you might say initially, votes are exactly not like money. They are as different from money as you could possibly get. Whenever we think something like that is happening, whenever we think money votes rather than people, we have a problem in our system. And indeed, you get slogans like this, people vote, money should not. And that expresses a specific type of political problem, a political stance, um, but it seems to say that we should not conflate, we should not even think of the democratic vote as some form of monetary exchange. And on some levels, that is definitely true. It's very dangerous to think about democracy as buying something. But on other levels, I would say um, there are certain similarities. And I think the people who first discovered these similarities lived in the city a few thousand years ago. Because now I want to carry some olds to Athens, as we say uh, in English. I want to remind you a little bit of uh, the structural similarities between voting and money exchanges that were discovered here a few thousand years ago. This is a voting coin from Athens. Uh, it was used um, to decide on whether to, um, uh, th that, that was a guilty vote in, 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 in a political accountability contest for uh, politicians. And obviously it is graphically or physically the sort of token that is very, very similar to a coin. 
It is anonymous. If you hand over the token, you can't trace it back to the person who initially owned it, who cast the vote. And that is very impo uh, important in a democratic process because we do not want undue influence being taken by the people who are voted for. It is important that the vote is secret precisely so that I can't buy it, precisely so that I can't give favors in exchange for receiving your vote. So here we have a very early recognition that anonymous tokens uh, of that type are a really, really good way of setting up a democratic decision-making process. And then there's another early Greek example, which I think is even closer to the uh, Bitcoin uh, as, as Agelos described it, an Ostraka. You probably know that. Uh, well, you definitely know that, sorry. <laughs> um, but why is that much, much more similar to what uh, we heard in the first talk? Well, the coin on the, on the left, uh, the round one, that one can be forged. If someone knows how these coins look, they are all looking identical or as identical as manufacturing technology of the time allowed. Once I know how these tokens look, I can make some of them. And I can inflate my vote by creating lots and lots of tokens for myself. With that randomly broken piece of pottery, that is much, much more difficult. So the election official takes a pot, breaks it into random pieces, at that point, all the people ele uh, entitled to vote randomly pick one piece. And that means, in particular, it is not possible for the voting official to trace back the specific piece to the specific voter. You just grab blindly into the box. And then you cast the vote. And in theory, at least, and that is obviously not what people did uh, in essence, but in theory, you could, after the vote, determine if only legitimate votes were cast because you can take all these charts and reproduce the pot from which they were made. That is, as Agelo said, a moderately difficult task. Well, actually, it is quite a difficult task, but it is at least possible in principle. So if I wanted to cheat in that vote and I take my own piece of pottery and break it, then the charts I will get will not fit into the puzzle that after the election, the election official would recreate because all these pieces are random to a certain degree, they all differ, it would not be possible for me to anticipate what type of chart I need to produce to cast a vote in that election. So we have a moderately difficult problem to ascertain that the vote was correct, we reproduce the pot, but once the pot is reproduced, everyone immediately and without any effort can see that all the votes were cast correctly. If I'm a citizen, if I'm concerned about corruption, if I think the voting officials miscounted the votes or let people vote who were not entitled, I can simply go up there and look at the pot. And I don't have to do anything else. Just look at it and I say, yes, that puzzle was solved correctly. So we have a very easy way to identify that the outcome was correct, but we have to invest a little bit of effort into the moderately difficult problem of recombining all these random pieces in one object. So I think the Ostraka really exemplifies the similarity between a token-based voting system and a cryptography-based blockchain system, because all the citizens are able to verify the vote collectively without being able to say who cast the vote. It involves a moderately difficult puzzle, and the confirmation that it was all correct is very, very easy and straightforward. So here we have a similarity, I think a strong similarity, between what we are doing when we vote and what we are doing when we're exchanging blockchains. Do we also have a problem that the blockchain can solve here? Well, as we've heard, blockchains replaces trust in institutions, in hierarchies, uh, with a enforced <coughs> trust between users. We ascertain for each other the correctness of the ledger. You don't rely any longer on the Bank of Scotland, and if you followed the news, relying on the Bank of Scotland can be a very dangerous and problematic thing indeed. We trust each other. So in certain situations, when we can't trust institutions, we have to rely to trust each other. So a good business case are institutions or societies where trust in the state and its institutions are weak, but communal trust is still strong. 
And the second aspect of that business case is societies where the financial infrastructure is lacking. Where you have a credit card system, for instance, where you trust the credit card provider, Visa or MasterCard, it's much, much more difficult to make a good case that we need something in addition. In societies where that infrastructure is lacking, where uh, financial institutions are underdeveloped, there's a much easier case to make for this. So these would be the use case constraints when we ask ourselves, is there a problem with the vote that we want to address? And that is a problem at first sight because that is really bad news. The type of societies where one and two obtain, especially one but also two, they are essentially the hallmarks of failing states. And we have a situation where people can't trust the state and its institutions any longer at all and have already fallen back to communal trust, then the state is probably breaking apart. And we do see that in real life in places like Somalia here. Not particularly good picture, but that was an attempt to recreate or reinstate a governmental system. So representatives of all the warring clans, all the warlords were invited to a room to form a government. Within 20 minutes, they started hitting each other because the loyalty and the trust that they owned to their respective fractions outweighed the trust and the respect they had for the centralized institutions. And if you think that happens only in Africa, uh, that is also pretty, pretty typical for at least the old Scottish society up until, say, uh, the late 19th century. You did not trust the king. You most certainly didn't trust the English, because that would be stupid. Uh, but the trusted the people who were walking around in the same type of frocks that you were wearing. If you are wearing a similar colored kilt, you are trustworthy. If you speak with a funny southern accent, you are definitely not. So the people you trust are your kin relations. And that is bad news for a functioning state. When we had a vote for independence in Scotland two years ago, there was a big question, what currency will this newly independent state have? Huh? The English said you can't use the pound. <coughs> the Spanish camouflaging as the European Union said you can't use the euro either. Some people said, well, we are exactly in that sort of situation. We can't trust the central institutions any longer, or they don't trust us, but we can trust each other, so let's make the Bitcoin, the currency of the newly independent Scotland. Uh, I voted for independence, but that specific argument made me wonder if that was a wise choice, uh, <laughs> just between you and me. Um, but there's a problem. It seems as if blockchain-based solutions are only applicable or most valuable in states that are in serious, serious trouble. And hopefully, we are not in that sort of situation. Hopefully, uh, we do still have trust in governments that is sufficient, not perfect trust, obviously not, but sufficient to run a democratic society. We don't yet fall back on trusting only a small circle of friends uh, or blood relatives. Or do we? Well, I'm um, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. And that's why you find working examples like the land <coughs> registry in Honduras. People don't trust the government. There's a single point of uh, a choking point. If you bribe one official, can change the entries in the land registry. If that becomes very easy because the public officials are underpaid, uh, then falling back to a distributed assurance is a good idea. Death registers in, in, uh, in India. You might not know that, but there's a party of the death in India, a party of the dead. Um, they are people who have been declared as being dead by corrupt officials in the official ledger. Typically because some of their relatives, say their brothers or their uncles, want their land. So much easier than faking the land register it is actually getting someone declared dead and having their name erased from the ledger. And then you go there and you jump up and down and says, I feel very much alive, take my pulse. And the answer is, well, you can't prove that you are that person. Oh, yes, I can prove it. My name is in that register. Ha ha, no, it isn't, we changed it. Uh, so suddenly you find a situation that really massively in certain rural communities, corrupt officials remove people from the one centrally controlled ledger. And the only way to prove that there was a illegal change in the ledger is to look at the ledger and compare it with a correct version. But there is no other correct version. There is only that one version. And we've seen in the talk that in distributed system, that is not any longer the case. There are lots and lots of equally valid uh, versions of it. And we can now see 
that one of these guys, the one with the horns, uh, made a uh, change that was not authorized. Banking in Kenya, uh, just as an example for emerging financial institutions where there is no um, working banking infrastructure with credit cards, as, as one of the other examples. So if these are the typical examples that we face, well, why would we even think about voting uh, by blockchain mature, stable, modern democracies? Well, last year, voter fraud hit the news. You will have followed this. Um, before he was elected, Donald Trump making massive accusations that lots and lots of people who were not entitled to vote had indeed cast the vote. Again, some of them dead, like in India, just the other way around. In India, the living are de uh, declared to be dead and can't vote any longer. In the US, allegedly, according to the president, uh, the dead do vote. Um, and on the other side, we get the same accusation, but with a different uh, spin to it. The Democrats as well uh, complained about vote of, vote of fraud not in the sense of people not entitled to vote casting uh, their vote, but people being excluded from the vote who were legally uh, allowed to. So voter suppression as a problem for democracy. So we have here a, okay, reasonable mature de democracy. They are a newcomer by Greek standards most certainly, only around for a couple of hundred years. But you would think that, uh, at least in theory, that is the type of society where we don't face these problems. I think here we have the, uh, the counter example. We have two types of voting fraud massively alleged by both sides in a heavily contested uh, election. One arguing there are way too many false positives, the other that there are way too many false negatives. Um, and then we have another problem of uh, correct voting. Uh, you can see immediately what's going on or what's going wrong there. It's not just necessary that everyone who is entitled to vote can vote and that nobody who is not entitled to vote is excluded, we also want secrecy of the vote. We don't want a system where important people in power can look over your shoulder and find out how you have voted. <laughs> the secrecy of the vote is also in mature working democracies. Uh, <coughs> this is filmed, isn't it? Okay, forget my next visa into the US. Um, <laughs> um, in mature working democracies, one of the requirements for a correct vote, that people do not know what I cast, that it can't be verified, because this way, voting is exactly not like a contract. There can't be a quid pro quo. No one can buy my vote because I can never prove whom I voted for. That is the idea of the secrecy of the vote. So if voter fraud hits the news in uh, even stable modern democracy, then maybe blockchain is a poss possible answer. And we do indeed, from the European Parliament amongst others, get this uh, increasing um, promotion of the idea that we can use blockchain um, to address exactly that sort of problem. And in the remainder of the talk, I will give you a little bit of an idea how and why that is indeed possible. If you look back at the fraud scenarios I just gave you, um, we are seeing the type of balances, the type of conflict that a good voting system and a good voting law has to address. Because that is essentially the issue that every democracy faces, that every legal system that organizes votes is facing. There are conflicting demands, and every balance that we strike <coughs> is always going to be just that, a compromise between conflicting and ultimately irreconcilable constraints. So ideally, we want legally entitled voters only, only people who are citizens, who are not disbarred from voting, can cast their vote. But ideally, we also don't want to exclude anyone who is allowed to vote. Everyone should be able to vote, really exercising the franchise who is entitled to. And obviously, from purely if you like, computational or mathematical uh, perspective that forces us to balance somehow the false positive versus the false negatives. <coughs> we could think of a voting system where we simply allow everyone to vote. 100% inclusivity, everyone entitled to vote can vote, but a very high number of false positives. Too many non-voters casting uh, their vote. And we can think of the opposite. We can make it really, really difficult for people to vote, built in lots and lots of assurances. 
make sure that only entitled voters cast their vote, but at the potential expense of excluding quite a lot of people from the franchise who are entitled to. And we find the same conflicting demands also when it comes to the accuracy of the vote, vote counting. I want to be sure that my vote was counted correctly. <coughs> it's not enough that I'm allowed to put something in a ballot box. I also need to be certain that it was counted for the party I actually voted for. If I don't trust the voting officials, I can't be sure of that any longer. And at the same time, we want the secrecy of the election. That is, ideally, my vote should be disconnected from me. And that is, again, a conflicting <coughs> demand. Um, oops. We could think of systems where I can see immediately if my vote was counted correctly. I sign my vote, and I stand over the official while they are counting. And I see they're making a notch the moment they see my vote. But the problem is they see my name in that case as well, and they can trace it back to me. So we've broken secrecy. <coughs> On the other hand, we can think of a totally secret vote <coughs> But then it becomes really, really difficult for me to say, well, amongst all these votes, mine was included. I know that mine is part of this bundle of votes that had been counted. So every legal system faces these four conflicting demands. Every legal system in a democracy tries to find rules to get an appropriate balance. The question is, can we, by using blockchain, either improve on that balancing, can we enhance all of these conflicting values. And if we can enhance only some of them, is that at the expense of others? Is maybe blockchain more inclusive, but at the same time slightly less transparent? And if so, is that rebalancing still within the parameters that we deem to be appropriate? So the main challenges for the legal framework, just as much as for the technological solutions, is to balance transparency and secrecy and is to balance integrity and inclusivity. Integrity, I mean people entitled to vote, citizen only are voting. Inclusivity, I mean as many people entitled to vote can vote. How did this work historically? Well, here we have an example where we have high inclusivity, medium transparency and secrecy, and very low integrity. Postal votes, ballot votes. It makes it easier to vote if I'm disabled, if I'm ill, if I have to work and can't go to the voting boot on the day, if I'm traveling abroad, I can simply send my vote in, in a secure envelope. So a high degree of inclusivity. Lots of people who might otherwise be excluded can participate. There is a degree of transparency and secrecy that we can engineer, having two different types of envelope, one uh, making sure that I was entitled to vote, the other one containing the actual votes. There are lots of methods um, that you probably encountered in your own life before. Every legal system comes up with more or less working solutions. <coughs> they can all be broken. For all of these systems, uh, there is a danger um, that um, uh, someone can find out that it was me who cast that specific vote. And even if it is just looking for fingerprints on the envelopes, for instance, just as a sort of hypothetical uh, possibility. If you are really, really concerned about secrecy, um, using physical tokens is for that reason alone potentially quite risky. And it has unfortunately very, very low integrity. Getting hold of empty ballot paper, sending them in, no one ever sees my face, no one can ever confirm how many votes I cast. That was precisely the reason why Donald Trump focused on postal votes. He said their entire warehouse is full of filled in envelopes where someone simply grabbed uh, the um, the voting um, sheets and, and fills them in for other people. And there's also the second problem that even if only people who are entitled to vote receive one of the ballot papers, we don't know under which pressure they were at the point of casting the vote. We don't know if someone stood behind them with a gun saying, could you please make your cross uh, there, thank you very much. Or going from house to house and saying, you are a good citizen, you are a good friend, um, your local community leader will fill them in for you. That are the things we can't make sure with blockchain, so uh, with, with postal voting. So they are scoring high on some uh, parameters. They are scoring really badly on others. That's Switzerland. 
uh, the cantonal elections that still exist in some parts of Switzerland, very, very old, going back to the Middle Ages. Um, every citizen comes to the market square on one specific day during the year and they vote on all of the officials and all of the policies by showing um, the ballot they were given. Very high transparency. Everyone can check on everyone else. In that sense, very much like distributed ledger technology, like blockchain, it becomes a communal task. I don't need an official any longer. I can see you all voting. And I can make sure that you are a citizen because either I know you anyway, you are my neighbor, or because you have one of these colored pieces of paper in your hand that only people entitled to the vote uh, has uh, been receiving. So a high level of transparency and with that high level of integrity, we can all check and we can also all check on the officials that count. If I'm really good at counting, maybe because I make a, a money playing, what is it, blackjack, where you have to count really, really quickly to beat the casino. Uh, if I'm good at that, then I can be as fast and as accurate as the official counter and immediately see, yes, the votes that are obviously cast right now tally to what the official is saying. It has low inclusivity. You might see that these people are in raincoats. It was pouring down on the day this photograph was taken. If you are old, if you are sick, if you really, really don't like the rain, if you are traveling abroad, if you have to work long hours, it will be impossible for you to participate. Um, you see on that photo, women were allowed to vote, so it must have been relatively recent. The Swiss got around this idea only at around 1970, 1980 on the cantonal level, so they might not be as concerned with inclusivity as others, um, but <laughs> there is this problem that potentially even people entitled to vote are excluded simply by the physical makeup of the vote. And there's obviously no secrecy whatsoever. I, as the official, see you voted for me and we made this deal, didn't we? I agreed to give you the planning permission for your farm if you vote for me, but now you are not holding up your card. Um, I promise to give you money when you vote for me. So there is no secrecy whatsoever, and as a result, the potential for fraud. Where do you come in? Where does cryptography come in? Now we can combine that idea, which scores high on transparency and integrity, uh, with cryptography. Here we have the same type of voting in a cryptographic <coughs> environment. Everyone cryptographed, sorry, their face, they now look all more or less identical. We can still, in theory, determine that all the people in the room are supposed to be in the room, but we cannot any longer determine who, in which individual cast a specific vote. Well, obviously, of course we can, uh, but I hope you get the message behind the image. Uh, if we hide behind something, if we anonymize ourselves, then potentially, at least, that big flaw, that big shortcoming of the Swiss system can be addressed. Um, just to put these historical examples into a legal context, I'm not going to talk a lot about German law. Um, that is exactly how German electoral law tries to get a way of balancing these conflicting demands. It simply says uh, elections have to be general, that means inclusive, direct, doesn't concern us. They have to be free, and that means in particular there mustn't be a possibility that at the point of casting my vote I'm unduly influenced. Equal, not a problem for us, and secret. And secret and, and free obviously um, uh, 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 belong together here. Um, there's a specific implementation or concretization of this idea in the electoral law, uh, which says something about voting machines which can be used instead of ballot paper, so we are allowed to use computers, if they maintain the same level of transparency, integrity, accountability as the normal paper-based mode. So the newcomer, the computing-based model, has to prove that it is as good as preserving these conflicting values as the existing system. Now, unfortunately, in some decisions, um, by the Constitutional Court regarding voting machines, that was interpreted, I gave the 2009 decision there, that was interpreted in one very specific way. The being as good as in 
accommodating these conflicting demands was interpreted as making exactly the same type of balance. So we must not lower any of the four or five constraints. It mustn't be any less transparent or any less secret or any less public than traditional voting, even if it achieves potentially an increase on any one of the other values. So the way the Germans, or the Constitutional <coughs> Court at least, I think regrettably interpreted these provisions was not only to say every potential new approach, every computer-based approach must have a good balance or an improved balance uh, between these conflicting values, but it must replicate the existing uh, balance uh, as accurately as possible. And that assumes that there were any intrinsic values in the way we used ballot papers or going to the postal office uh, or to the voting office. And I don't think there were any intrinsic reasons for that. They were constraints by technology. The specific type of balance we had traditionally was not caused by any democratic theory or theory of law. It was simply caused by what was technologically possible. And if that is the case, then we are allowed, and I think we should ask ourselves, if the technology changes, can't we not think of equally legitimate but slightly different ways of balancing these conflicting demands. Um, so I gave the role of cryptography. How can we implement this? Well, in the US, there is one uh, application developed commercially. It's called Follow My Vote. I would encourage you to have a look at that. I think they um, identified the issues better than any other uh, competitor that I know, which tries to do exactly that. It tries to use blockchain and cryptography to ensure the m greatest amount of secrecy possible while maintaining a even higher level of transparency. I can always go back and check that my vote was cast and that it was counted for the party I voted for. At the same time, bearing some really, really lucky guessing on the side of uh, an attacker, no one, including the election officials, can find out how I voted. So we have here, by using cryptography, the possibility that I can see that these numbers are me, and only I can see that these numbers are me. <coughs> and everyone else can see that someone cast a vote here for, say, the Republicans, and that vote was counted as a vote for the Republicans, but they can't see that it was my vote that it was counted for the Republicans. Um, for the technical detail, I have to refer you at this point um, to, 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 to the website, but essentially the idea is that I separate the role of the person who certifies that I'm elected to vote from the person who certifies that I did cast my vote, which is essentially the computer, the machine. So the one issues me a cryptographic token and only knows that a person has received this token, but not how it will look like. And uh, the receiving entity, the computer, can check that it was a authorized token, but can't any longer see that it was given to me and not to someone else. And that is pretty much, as I said, the old idea of the Ostraka. That is breaking the pot and reassembling it afterwards as closely implemented in computer code as I could find. As I said, technology allows us, in that respect, to come up with new and slightly different, slightly more nuanced balancing between these conflicting values. And potentially, at least, I would say, a blockchain-based voting scores higher on transparency than our existing voting systems, which is good news if we don't trust any longer the elected officials. Uh, it scores I would say probably at least as highly in terms of the integrity of the vote, that is, no one else can interfere with it, uh, and uh, also on the secrecy of, of the vote. There are other social problems that are raised when you implement this, and they are the same with any ballot-based proxy system. If I vote sitting at home <coughs> on my computer, or if I vote on my mobile phone, then of course someone else could put pressure on me at that point of casting my vote. Um, but that is the same with ballot voting, with postal voting. And that leads me to the final few comments of my talk. Can we think maybe even more radically what we want from a good election? Not just these historical 
um, constraints that were partly the result of contingent historical facts, the type of societies they grew out of, and equally contingent technological constraints, having a postal service, having uh, buildings in which you can cast a vote. These technological, mechanical constraints can we think about what we would ideally want from a vote. Um, and that moves us, us beyond transparency and secrecy. We could, for instance, wonder whether if we have a ballot system, there isn't a problem that people get disengaged from the po political process. That was one of the problems that came up in the US election. A significant number of citizens cast their vote by postal ballots weeks before the final day of the election. If you do that, and two days later, a big scandal emerges that your candidate was in reality a KGB uh, agent, and I'm not saying obviously that any of the candidates in the US election was a K KGB agent. <coughs> um, <laughs> um, then I can't change my vote. And there was a concern that something that is important for political life, important for democracy, that people make arguments, that they debate them, that they are checked, that they engage with the citizens, becomes devalued when some people say, months before the election, I know anyway what I'm voting for. The same people I always voted for, my parents voted for, my grandparents voted for, because they are our type of people, and I cast my vote. That might be bad for democracy. You might be concerned about that, especially if the numbers become very, very high. And here we have potentially the uh, possibility to cast the vote, but change it later on in an anonymous way. The only thing other people can say is that person changed their opinion, but not to what and who I am. So we have the possibility of changing the vote later on, becoming or staying more engaged with the political process. And that obviously is also an advantage for the problem of the integrity of the vote. Yes, you can put a gun at my head and force me to vote now for the people you want to. But there are still three days or four days, and I can change my vote in a secure and authentic way. And if I can do that, then there's no guarantee that I will stick it with the way you forced me to do so. So potentially, we can reduce the dangers that exist in any type of proxy voting. And then finally, we can also see it as a way to incentivize public participation in the political process. Um, as you've seen in the first talk, participating in a block of Bitcoin or in a blockchain requires everyone to pitch in with their computing power, to donate some of it, to mine for the Bitcoins, to uh, keep copies of the ledger. So it becomes a communal task. You have to contribute. You pay something. And it might not be the worst idea to treat democracy not just as a, I vote myself quick, a rich quick scheme, but a political duty, something that demands something from us and is not just for us a way to get whatever we want. And one possibility is to treat blockchain as a way to <coughs> remind us of this. We don't have to go full Starship Trooper. I don't know if you read that book. Uh, the idea essentially was if you want to have the vote, if you want to have the franchise, you must first give something to the community. You must show that you value the community more than yourself. And in Heinlein's book that is joining the military, killing aliens and uh, possibly getting killed in the process. We don't want to go there. That seems to be slightly excessive. Um, it also advantages physically strong people over the physically weak ones. Uh, but the principal idea is that it is not unjustifiable to ask <coughs> citizens in a <coughs> police to make a contribution for the democratic process, to take ownership of it, and to say this is our mutual responsibility and I'm willing to make a form of payment doesn't seem to me to be a bad idea. And the distributed uh, ledger approach to voting where I have to donate part of my computing power for this would at least be a symbolic token into that direction. So essentially, ultimately I conclude, even though blockchain-based voting will strike a different legal balance uh, than the one our existing legal systems sometimes do, that is still not a reason to reject them. And quite on the contrary, there are good arguments uh, that we should uh, experiment with it and put it into place. So in the future, our artificial overlords will have a vote as well. Thank you. <laughs> So
So um, we do have time for one question. Um, so if you have uh, any question for Booker, uh, uh, please uh, step in, raise, raise your hands. Uh, any question? Yes. So uh, I very much enjoyed your talk that I hear from you. And I still have one comment on the <coughs> security and environmental perspective, um, which I usually take. Um, the normal working system can be understood by anyone who can check okay, the mark of the paper and the paper that were marked where they come in. Mm -hmm. For blockchain, I would consider myself a sort of a security expert, but I would not vouch for the complexity of a working software running on a mobile phone or any other computer. So, what's your point on the security perspective? Um, well, firstly, Whenever we evaluate risks, we should evaluate them in comparison to the existing risks, which is something we very often forget. Um, we might think that we understand exactly how paper-based voting works, but do we really? Um, how many people have participated, for instance, as electoral helpers and really seen how papers were shuffled from one desk to the other? How many people were looking at it? if other assistants bringing in water uh, were allowed into the room, if people were allowed to go to the toilet while making these changes. And that is already on a very coarse grained level. Um, you are potentially asking, or you should be asking, um, of the election official, I can't see what's going on in your brain. I don't know exactly how you process the information that comes in there. I don't know if your brain is secure and if you maybe through a uh, use acquired deficiency in mathematics are perfectly incapable of counting correctly. Um, sometimes I think if the security software complaints are made, the equivalent would be to say we also need to uh, quality assure uh, the neural network that uh, is implemented in these squishy biological entities. So that, that would be one part um, of my answer. Uh, the second one is um, part of it is the result of getting used to it and uh, habituating uh, yourself to it. Uh, we found the same type of argument, I think, historically, whenever a change in the vote was introduced. The Swiss were really, really skeptical initially about uh, closed up voting booth for the same reason. We don't understand any longer what's going inside. It black boxes them. And uh, finally, I would say this is. You are also absolutely right, and we shouldn't be complacent. And one of the things that this requires is to find better ways of communicating and making transparent what is happening in the blockchain. I think we found a very good example in the first talk. I think this was the type of explanation that should work for quite a lot of people. If you could link that more directly with the code, more directly with the software, so that the software itself shows on its surface what it is go that is going on. Um, that would be something that ought to be done as well, absolutely. Yeah. Right, so